This time on Motor Week 91, Chrysler tries to top its successful minivans. Lisa Barrow looks at how older Americans stay on top of their driving skills. We look at an American staple reborn, full-size GM station wagons. And we go to Japan for an auto world look at how cars are sold there. So come drive with us, next. Motor Week 91, television's automotive magazine, is made possible by the financial support of public television viewers like you. Your host from Motor Week 91, John Davis. Hello and welcome to Motor Week 91. We're glad to have you with us. The 80s will be remembered for many things, not the least of which is the minivan explosion. When Chrysler introduced their Caravan and Voyager back in 1983, they virtually invented a market segment and changed forever our ideas about family transportation. Well, minivans are still strong for Chrysler, but competition in the segment is growing, and it's because of that competition that Chrysler decided to update its design. Even the best of ideas need to be rethought every now and again, so let's see what Chrysler has done. What's apparent at first sight is that Chrysler didn't spend too much time on changing the appearance of their second generation minivan. Actually, the new van styling is much softer than before. The lower hood line and wraparound front lamps are more car-like and not unlike those of the Mazda MPV. All body panels except the roof are new, and the rear hatch now includes a high-mounted stop lamp. However, no one ever faulted the outside of the Dodge Caravan, Plymouth Voyager, and Chrysler Town & Country. So it takes a detailed tour of the interior to really appreciate how much has changed. All of the room is still here, it's just now much more user friendly. Most controls have been moved from stalks and hiding places on the lower dash to pods on either side of the steering wheel. A driver's airbag is slated to be added next spring. It will be a first for a minivan. But right now we wish most cars had as comprehensive a gauge cluster as this one. The up-level cluster has closely grouped engine readouts. When we tested this Plymouth Voyager SE prototype at Chrysler's Proving Grounds, we were impressed by the quality of the seat and door fabrics. These sculptured cushions have a high fashion look unknown in past Chrysler vans. The foam injected seats were also quite comfortable with good side and back support for a family chariot. One driver comfort complaint, the parking brake pedal takes up too much of the floorboard space. Cruise controls reside at the bottom of the wheel, and it only takes a short reach to get to the pod switches for lights and wipers. Switches now work with a sturdy, tactile feel. The gear shift remains on a big steering column stock, but the radio has been moved much higher in the center console. The ventilation controls are now also in the center and easier for the passenger to reach. The remote hatch release and rear defroster switch have been moved to a convenient spot under the radio. While all minivans are big on big item storage, the Chrysler design also excels for stowing small things. The large glove box is new, while the huge underseat storage locker has been retained. Most models can be ordered with a full-length console. It has a tilting bin at the bottom, a storage nook higher up, and a disappearing cup holder. With its front-wheel drive design, it's easy to walk to the center and rear seats of the Chrysler vans. A rear heating and air conditioner blower is available, and all the outboard seats use shoulder belts. The heavy van-style sliding door remains, but it now has a handy inside grab handle to make operation easier. Around back, the single-piece hatch opens as before. You still need a key to do it, and the seats fold as before. However, the seats are now easier to remove thanks to a seat latch system that no longer fights back. As before, the hatch has its own strap to aid closing. On the road, the car-like handling of the original Dodge and Plymouth vans has been enhanced. Numerous changes in the front-wheel drive suspension and steering components used on Chrysler cars have been incorporated here. Directional stability is very good. Body roll, while reduced, remains moderate. Engine selections remain much as before. Base vans come equipped with a 100-horsepower 2.5-liter four-cylinder with a three-speed automatic. 
Chrysler's 150 horse 3.3 liter V6 and electronic four speed automatic combo is standard on stretched vans. Our original length model had that four speed with the three liter 141 horsepower Mitsubishi V6 engine. It delivered a fine 12.2 second zero to 60 result. The big powertrain addition for 1991 is the available all wheel drive. Designed to improve wet and poor road traction, it is a fully automatic system. Under routine conditions, 90% of the power goes to the front wheels. If the front wheels begin to slip, however, up to 45% of the power goes to the rear wheels. Chrysler now has the only van design available in either front or all-wheel drive. The all-wheel drive system will add about $1,900 to van prices, which should begin around $13,000 and stretch all the way to twice as much. About another $800 will be required to add Bendix four-wheel anti-lock brakes. It is clear that Chrysler has done a remarkably restrained job in developing their renewed minivan line. Engineers clearly took the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it adage to heart. It may not be shaped like a spaceship, but then you don't have to be an astronaut to understand it. The 1991 Plymouth Voyager, Dodge Caravan, and Chrysler Town & Country design is impressive not only in what has been completely changed, but more so in how things that remained the same were made better. When the minivan hit the market, it looked like curtains for the full-size rear-wheel drive station wagon. After all, minivans could manage the same family chores on less gas and take up less space in the carport. But big wagons have shown amazing stamina and recently gained new prestige. The 1991 redesign from General Motors is being shared by Chevrolet, Buick, and Oldsmobile. They are naturally very big. They're also stylish, powered by a good old-fashioned American V8, and more. For instance, all varieties feature a standard V8 engine and airbag for the driver, six or eight passenger seating, and standard four-wheel anti-lock brakes. Plus, the most affordable Chevrolet Caprice comes fully equipped for a base price of $17,875. There is no other wagon, and for that matter, no minivan, that can match these specifications at any price. But let's get back to big and stylish. All three wagons share sheet metal that flows from an individualized grille to a common teardrop in the rear. The look is not unlike that of the Ford Taurus and Audi wagons. But in this case, the sheer size of the aerodynamic shell is daunting. It's so big, it is prestigious. And the Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser and Buick Roadmaster go one step further with the return of the Vista Roof Skylight. Under each long sloping hood is the same V8. Chevy's 5-liter uses twin throttle body injection, developing 170 horsepower and 255 pound-feet of torque. That's enough for a trailer towing limit of 5,000 pounds. Under normal driving conditions, EPA economy ratings are 16 city and 25 highway. The typical minivan has a highway rating of 24 or less. Each model includes a high level of luxury for its class. The Roadmaster has the most luxurious appointments of the group, although in a decidedly American fashion. Large, common-sense controls and clear gauges are highlights of all three. The front bench is a 55-45 split, which means the middle passenger might be a bit uncomfortable. Around back, the twin-action tailgate opens down or out. The bumper has a built-in step for access to the optional rear-facing third seat. Opening rear vent windows are a nice touch. With all seats folded, cargo room totals a huge 170 cubic feet. In addition, this useful roof rack is standard. Our initial testing was limited to GM's Michigan Proving Ground. However, over a variety of road surfaces, the design delivered a smooth, quiet ride with handling that was less like a whale than we expected. What minivans have done for full-size wagons is to transform them from middle-class mainstays to prestige models for families that don't want to look middle-class. Here, the Chevrolet Caprice, Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser, and Buick Roadmaster all succeed in a big way. In 1920, only 5% of the population was 65 or older. Today, nearly 13% of our population is over 65. That's 31 million Americans, and the figure is growing. What does this have to do with cars and driving? Well, Lisa Barrow is about to answer that in her FYI report on older drivers. In the coming years, what's going to happen is we're going to have millions more older drivers on the road. 
that's due in part to the baby boomers and in part to the fact that people are just living longer. The Transportation Research Board predicts that by the year 2020, 17% of the population will be 65 or older. That means over 50 million people in this age group will be eligible to drive, almost half of whom will be 75 or older. Steps have to be taken now in order to meet the needs of this growing older driver population. Two areas getting immediate attention are the driver and the vehicle. Keep your mind and your eyes on the road. If you get lost or confused, don't stop and block traffic. This is a 55 Alive Mature Driver course, sponsored by the American Association of Retired Persons. Classes like this one are held on a regular basis throughout the U.S. It's an awareness course to get our seniors to think when they're behind the wheel of a car, to look beyond what's right in front of them. Learn to deal with some of the things that happen quickly. Students also learn about some of the common mistakes drivers make as they age, like failure to yield right of way. That's true of White's point. There's one intersection where it, you come to a dead end and there's a sign that says no left turn and no right turn. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Go up. <laughs> you gotta go backwards. <laughs> Individuals that take the 55 Alive Mature Driver course, or one like it, are oftentimes eligible for a discount on their car insurance. And to keep the discount, they have to retake the class every three years. Turning from the driver to the vehicle, auto manufacturers like Ford Motor Company are making their cars more user-friendly for the older driver. Well, we have uh, conducted drive surveys where we have trained human factors engineers riding with mature drivers. And this has been very informative. We observe what they do while they're driving, what they are not able to do, and uh, question them as to what they want and what they prefer. And in some cases, the older driver is monitored by a computer. In this Ford Taurus, for example, the computer in the trunk monitors what controls a driver uses. In the end, we have a good idea of how often each control is used. And those controls that are frequently used receive prime locations in terms of reach and visibility. Automobiles for a long time have been a symbol of independence. No matter what age, we all cherish the freedom of getting in the car and going. Changes in vehicle design and courses like 55 Alive are just some of the ways to ensure highway safety in the future and protect our privilege to drive as we grow older. Collecting the Mercedes-Benz SL 1954 to 1990 is a compilation of articles by John R. Olson from his SL Market Letters. Olson gives us market figures which suggest that investing in an SL is the next best thing to buying an impressionist painting. This book will make SL owners glow, but it's little help to the enthusiast who wants to know how to choose a car for investment. Olson is more interested in appreciation than telling us where to look for rust. Pat Goss is always a good one for pointing out hidden rust. He does it to our cars in the Motor Week parking lot all the time. Well, he's here this time with some information for repairing your car. Pat? John, cars today are very complicated. As a matter of fact, many of them have more electronic components than the average home computer. Now, with that in mind, the average owner of a modern automobile needs to take a little extra time and research the repair shop that's going to repair this complicated car. First thing the repair shop needs to have is, such as we see here, a business computer system. Now, why that? Well, it's pretty simple. See, first off, you're going to get legible repair orders. You know, the, the receipt that you get, you're going to be able to read it for a change. Now, that would be a pleasant surprise. Secondly, we're going to have a situation where the technician can go back through your repair history and see what has been done on the car in the past so there aren't duplicate repairs and so that if there is a symptom that's showing oh, a, a pattern that's going on, then they can find it in your repair history. Lots of things like that. They can also send you repair reminders for things that are scheduled maintenance, all of these things that make it a lot easier to keep up with the modern car. Now, next thing. The shop has to have some type of diagnostic tester. Now, here we have a Sun computer analyzer. This is used for a number of different things. First, it's used to check the engine in the car. You can do an engine diagnosis and check all kinds of electronics parts with it. But above and beyond that, this particular one is equipped with a GM Expertech system. 
Now, ExpertTech is a system to retrieve technical service bulletins. Well, technical service bulletins are things that tell the technician of particular problems on your given car. And it tells all sorts of little tricks and ways to correct these problems. In this particular case, we have a wire wheel cover noise problem that uh, we've brought up here. And this is going to tell us, both through words and pictures, how we would go about correcting that particular situation on the average GM car. Now, you know, that could save a lot of time and money in diagnosing and repairing something like that. Okay, so this is a must, but this Expertech only applies to General Motors cars. What if you have something other than General Motors? Well, here we have an all data system. All data is similar to the Expertech, except it covers all makes and models of cars. Now, to give you an idea, in my Mercury Sable, I have a problem with the fuel gauge. It becomes very erratic at times. So I've put that in here, and I'm going to punch up the information regarding that particular problem on my car. Now, here it's telling us that there is a slosh module that may or may not be in this vehicle, and that it is possible that it might have to be fitted with this. Now, we can also print this information so that we have all of it spelled out on a piece of paper. We can take it to the car, really do the repairs right from that bulletin. So you can see how this could be very beneficial in the repair of the average car. Now, another thing that is a big problem, a lot of cars only have problems while they're moving down the highway. So how do you diagnose them? Well, you have to diagnose them while that problem is occurring. So here we have a collection of portable test equipment a scanner to check the computer, an oscilloscope to check the ignition system, and an exhaust gas analyzer to see what's happening at the tailpipe of the car. All of these things are vital in dealing with repair problems on modern automobiles. You know, if you follow through with this, you can save yourself a lot of time, money, and aggravation. And if you have a problem with your car, whatever it might be, how about writing to me? If I select your letter to be used on the air, I'll send you a MotorWeek t-shirt. The address is Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Cars are sometimes troublesome, and we know that you like to avoid the ones that are, or at least know what kind of temperament to expect from the car you want to buy. That's why we test some cars for the long term. It's time now to report on our long-term test cars and to say goodbye to one that we wish we could keep forever. You've probably guessed that I'm talking about the Mazda MX-5 Miata. We had a lot of fun with the Miata over the last 30,000 miles and learned a lot too. We learned it was frugal to drive. Fuel economy continued to improve, ending the test at 29.2 miles per gallon. Total operating costs were inexpensive at 4.6 cents per mile. Between 5 and 6 cents is average for all cars. We also learned that the Miata was not without a few faults. Our car was one of the first ones imported, and it had a minor top leak. Also, the top boot tore, the rear window zipper broke, and the ignition switch developed a dead spot that caused the wipers and air conditioning to not work until you jiggled the key. But at the end of our test, both the clutch and shocks showed only normal wear. We've had no recent problems with the smallest vehicle in our test fleet. The Subaru Justy ECVT still delivers excellent mileage, now at 36.2 after 20,038 miles. While this tiny automatic's fuel economy has dropped about three miles per gallon over the test, operating costs remain miserly at only four cents per mile. Fuel economy is not the major reason for buying the Chevrolet Lumina APV minivan, space is. With the seven seats in our van and 21.1 miles per gallon over nearly 21,000 miles, all this space is being moved with reasonable efficiency. Cost per mile is six cents flat. The APV's plastic skin also impressed us with its resilience. A bucket full of gravel thrown off a bridge left plenty of paint nicks, but no dents and no cracks in the huge windshield. Our newest long-term model is this 1991 Ford Explorer. With a quick 13,000 miles in four months, it was our staff's favorite summer vacation hauler. The Explorer contained most any off-road wilderness, yet has as tame a highway ride as most cars. 
Mileage, however, is only fair at 17 miles per gallon. Operating costs are thus high at 7.5 cents per mile. Our Explorer experienced only one fault. A loose wire caused the air conditioning to quit on a very hot day. Once fixed, the Explorer continued to help us discover new reasons to confirm why it's tops in its field. Our car of the week is a 1955 Dodge LaFemme. It belongs to Ed and Joanne Thrun of Onalaska, Wisconsin. If you have an interesting car to show us, we'll consider it for car of the week. Just send a good color photo along with a self-addressed return envelope to Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Women today might be a little insulted if Detroit tried to sell them pink painted cars called La Femme. Well, we know Lisa Barrow would be anyway. She's here now to tell us what's going on in Detroit and elsewhere. The latest news we have from Detroit, John, concerns Ford's upcoming Mustang. This illustration is the most recent educated guess at what the 1993 Mustang will look like. As we reported earlier, the GT will be powered by Ford's new 4.6-liter, 32-valve V8 engine. Base and LX-grade cars will get four cylinders or V6 power. The big question is which chassis will Ford use? The current chassis, a shortened version of the Thunderbird Cougar chassis, and the new all-wheel drive Tempo Topaz chassis are being considered. Whichever platform is chosen, it will feature speed-sensitive power steering, four-wheel disc brakes, and optional ABS. While our spy car is from Detroit, this week's recall is from Japan. More specifically, from Honda, which is recalling 65 of its 1990 Civics. The problem is with painted layers in the windshield mounting area, which may lack adhesion due to defective paint. This could lead to a weakening of windshield retention, and in extreme cases, could cause the windshield to separate from the vehicle. Owners of affected cars will be instructed to bring them into dealerships to have the windshield reinstalled. In our new Under the Sun department, car buyers can look forward to the new Nissan Sentra, which has just arrived in local showrooms. It's powered by either a 1.6 or a 2-liter 4-cylinder. Prices will start at $8,000 for the base two-door, with a five-speed highway fuel economy estimate topping out at 38 miles per gallon. There's no experience quite like that of buying a car. It's made up of equal amounts of joy and frustration. The joy comes from the possession of a beautiful new automobile. The frustration, as we all know, comes from the picking, choosing, and sometimes lengthy negotiations necessary to make the car yours. And it doesn't matter where in America you go or what you buy, every dealer does it the same way. But go to another country and the car buying process is as different from ours as night from day. Take Japan, for instance. Over there, the car you test drive is not the car you buy. And the salesman can be the best friend you've got. Like America, Japan is a nation obsessed with the automobile. Just about everyone wants to own the newest, most advanced vehicle available. Not only that, but Japanese tax and emission laws make it financially advantageous to replace your car every three years. With almost 40 million licensed drivers in the entire country, at least 5 million people look seriously for a new car in any given year. But if you expect to see Japanese cities packed with warring car dealerships, you're sadly mistaken. Japanese dealerships are not independently owned, but are franchised on a regional basis. Each prefecture, the Japanese equivalent of a state, has one company selling a particular brand of cars through several outlets. In the Aichi Prefecture, Toyota products are sold exclusively by Aichi Toyota. The pride of Aichi Toyota is the Toyota Twin Cam outlet near the city of Nagoya. Toyota Twin Cam is the largest multi-service car dealership in Japan, covering over 200,000 square feet of floor space. Its heart is Toyota I, a spacious modern new car showroom that keeps 30 new Toyota models on display at any given time. In a country where space is at a premium, most Japanese dealerships only have room for a handful of display cars. But here, customers can browse at their leisure before sitting down with a salesman. The salesman alone will assist the customer with everything from registration to insurance. The customer then orders the car and waits patiently for it to be delivered. And since Japanese custom is to pay sticker price, the old game of let me talk to the manager does not exist. 
The usual test drives are available, and if you're interested in an off-road vehicle, Twin Cam has a back-breaking off-road test course that gives you a true picture of how your new 4x4 will perform in the rough. If you want more than the standard test drive, you can rent a car like the one that you're interested in and drive it to Twin Cam's Kurumaza Drive-In Theater. Hungry? Then visit the Terrace Cafe Twins Restaurant. Both it and the theater are open to the general public. As is the Alpha Art Gallery. Amateur artists and groups are invited to present their works here for public display. By now, it's obvious that this is no ordinary car dealership. Twin Cam is the prototype for a new breed of Japanese auto retailer known as the Concept Outlet. A concept outlet is part car dealership, part community center, and part shopping mall. It's an attempt to make car dealers an integral part of the community, and it looks like it works. We initially targeted to receive about 20,000 visitors a year to Twin Cam. However, we are receiving about um, 15,000 a month, and on Sundays, we receive about 1,000 visitors and 700 parking space is filled. The sales numbers are impressive too. Twin Cam sells about 100 cars each month. That's big volume by Japanese standards. Of course, Twin Cam does offer all of the normal dealership services, such as the Techno 50 Repair Center, where you are invited to watch your car being fixed. Toyota Twin Cam is so complete that customers almost don't have to go home. If they do, it can be to a Toyota custom-built modular home, models of which are available on the other side of the parking lot. If you're thinking that this is all just another crazy Japanese fashion, you're wrong. Concept outlets like Toyota Twin Cam are carefully planned to make long-term customers of the world's most demanding car buyers. It not only makes the local car dealership a much less intimidating place to go, but gives the phrase one-stop shopping an eye-opening new meaning. We give you auto information in one stop, and next time we'll have a special look at 1991 products from Ford and another 91 model road test. Pat Goss will be along too, and Craig Singhaus will return to fulfill a longtime automotive fantasy, working on a pit crew. Be sure to join us. I'm John Davis, and we'll see you then. MotorWeek 91 is made possible by the financial support of public television viewers like you. If you'd like a transcript of this program, send $4 to MotorWeek Transcripts, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland at 20 cents sales tax. Ask for show number 1001. is a production of Maryland Public Television.